Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads. Welcome back. I know it's been quite some time since we since we had an episode, but here we are. Live and dangerous. Um I am of course Shane. I'm Connor. I'm Mike. Yes, they are. And we also have another guy here. His name is Michael from Michael, do you want to introduce yourself, actually? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Michael with Destination Linux and uh, This Week in Linux podcast. As I'm really happy to be here. This, this is going to be fun. Guys, we've had a whole two to three months since we, well, not since we spoke, but <laughs> but uh, since we did this, and it's been a bit of an action-packed summer. Uh, what did everyone get up to? I started a new job only about two or three months ago, so I've not actually taken any holidays from that as of yet but i am planning to take um some time off in october and probably around the christmas period um but other than that i haven't really been on holiday so it's just been no work i said what did you do during the summer <laughs> working <laughs> um mike you i think you went somewhere didn't you yeah i went to spain it's a beautiful place go there every year Ah, so you remember that time we thought you were in Spain? And I was actually in Prague, yeah, because I go... (laughs) (laughs) So this time you actually were in Spain? Yeah, this time I was actually actually selling my arse in Spain, literally. It was really hot, the food was amazing, so I did that, and I watched a whole lot of um, flat earth debunking videos, I don't know why, it just makes me feel smarter, really, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I can't do it, I just can't. Yeah, I can't look at it through their eyes. I feel like I'm going to start believing no, it myself or something. Is, I, I don't watch the originals. I watch like the guys like Simon and debunking them. And the thing is, it's humbling because you realize, shit, I'm not so clever. I didn't know this either. The only difference between me and the flat is that I'm not that paranoid and I don't believe everybody's lying, and is lying to me. But like, yeah, the stuff that you actually learn, you know, I'm 20 years out of school now or, or so. Um, so physics, I haven't looked at for a very long time. So it is, it is humbling and you learn a lot just by watching, uh, other people making quite, uh, fools out of themselves, you know? Over the summer, um, I know I've been threatening to learn Blender for quite some time and I actually did. I actually went through some tutorials and I, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, uh, like, like, uh, golf clap for, for a chain there. Yeah, I can, I can 3D model you a golf club and <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I learned some Blender, went through a tutorial, uh, Blender Guru. It's a pretty famous tutorial where he gets you to make like a donut and coffee and all that shit. And, uh, yeah, I only made the donut before I realized I made a critical error. Uh, I looked at his, his tutorial screen because my computer was going crazy slow. So I uh, looked at my verts, which is your vertices in your model. Uh, his were 22,000 verts and mine was 344,000. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I applied too many modifiers or, uh, like, uh, too, 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 like smooth a texture. Basically, I added too much detail to the, to the model and it was just my computer was like nearly like Chernobyl. It was crazy. But, um, so in summary, you made a donut of the situation. Oh, God. <laughs> Um, but yeah, but most, most importantly, I, I think the, the eagle eyed, uh, telegram chatters w- would have seen this. Um, I went to Finland, uh, for a wedding and I was in Helsinki. So I thought, you know, Linus Torvalds, University of Helsinki, Cradle of Linux, all that kind of thing. I thought, why don't I go find the computer science department of the University of Helsinki and just i don't know i thought it would be cool i thought to be a plaque i could take a picture of or something like that um but yeah it didn't disappoint it took a while to find because i actually went to the old campus and then you know had to go find the new computer science department which was about two miles away uh in a brand new campus so uh i spent about 30 euro renting electric scooters on my own in helsinki (laughs) looking for the birthplace of linux (laughs) And it took me about four hours to find it. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I got a picture of uh, the Linus Torvalds Auditorium in uh, in the University of Helsinki. So, uh, we we'll, we can include a link to the picture in the show notes because I really want people to see that because it took it, you know, more more of my life than it should have. <laughs> 
so we've got some news coming up and we also have a little chat with Michael about KDE. Um, that should be fun because I think, I think our opinions are quite split down the middle there. Who knows? Um, but first we have a, a coupon code for Azire, which is a VPN provider based in Sweden. So the coupon code will get you 30% off when you pay for three months of Azire VPN. Uh, Azire VPN are a really good provider. They're very security focused. Uh, as I said, they're based in Sweden where the law doesn't require them to log traffic. They operate servers in Europe and North America. Their servers are owned and not rented. They're installed on location by their own engineers and they're running Debian Linux. They provide a weird... <laughs> They provide a WireGuard, an open VPN option. Their client is GPL version 2 licensed, and it is available on Linux. They take uh, all major payment methods, including some cryptocurrency. And best of all, you don't even have to give them your email address, which is a feature I really appreciate. Um, use the code LinuxLads when ordering, and make sure to click the green Add Code button to make sure you get that discount. And that is valid until the 1st of January 2020. So, on to the news. Uh, Mike, you've added quite a bit of news today. So, the first and foremost, I know it's been a long break. I know there hasn't been a lot of, uh, you know, there's too much to talk about almost, I think. But I think high on the list is uh, Richard Stallman and his uh, faux pas um, and all that all that drama surrounding that. In um, in, the, in my tradition of sweeping generalizations, he basically got me too, really. And um, re- last week, his past statements kind of caught up with him in a storm. I think everybody heard about that. And then uh, he resigned from uh, as a head of the Free Software Foundation. He resigned from the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies. And uh, he is still staying as the head of uh, the GNU project. So that one he's keeping. He's posted it today. It uh, um, That's Friday when we are recording this. Uh, there is no, you know, so far there is no, no, no one says anything if uh, they are going to change anything or if they are just staying on the same course. Uh, it, I kind of put this news in there. Because it's an interesting discussion. There's a there, there, there's that's I think that's out of the summer when we were gone. This this uh, RMS uh, removal is probably the mo the, the biggest news as far as, as I'm concerned. Yeah, Michael, uh, what what did you make of this? I mean, I would just say I'm not really surprised by it because if you just read the things that he says, they're you know not really defensible. So I'm not surprised that this happened. I'm kind of surprised that it took as long as it did, um, just based on the, 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 how long he's been saying these things. Um, but, uh, there's, you know, there's arguments to say that, he, you know, he's done so much that they should, you know, ignore it. And I think that, yes, he's done a lot of things and he's done a lot of great things. And I, I but I don't think that those things should shield him from any consequences for no matter what he does. You know, there are certain things that, you know, societal reactions are going to be an issue, regardless if it's, you know, in if it was just in the community and it was not an outside uh, person who, is, who initiated it, I think it'd be a different reaction. And I think it probably should have happened prior anyway. Yeah, I mean, I can, you know, I can, I can sort of agree with you there, actually, because uh, when I first saw, like, his original comments, I, I thought, Jesus, like, that's... Not sure about that. Like that's, you know, I, I don't think there was any intention on his part to, to be, to be brazen or insensitive or, or weird or anything like that. But I just think the guy, it's just his personality. I think, I think he just isn't really connected with, with the real world sometimes. Like he, he, he I think he, he, uh, has this personality where if he's speaking, he just assumes everyone knows what he means or something. I don't know. I don't think there was any malice in in what he said or did, but yeah, you're right. I mean, there's consequences for things you say. So, um, and I don't think it was a witch hunt. He wasn't drummed out of anything. Like, you know, it was pretty clear cut, in my opinion. Uh, Connor, well, my my opinion of it was there's uh, something similar as in a, a, it was. Sp- there was a person who's in leadership position and they, they were seen as being quite brazen and insensitive 
and no, um, no, nothing is the any way that there were the same comments whatsoever was the Linus Torvalds situation and fair play to Linus Torvalds he says listen I'm stepping down um, temporarily I may be back um, and then after after a month he says okay and as far as I can tell, he has changed his his behavior and probably has learned the lesson of there's a difference between when you're in, in that much of a leader pos- leadership position, there's the, there's a difference between your personal opinion and uh, essentially knowing when to comment and when not to comment, know, knowing when to bite your tongue and when not to bite your tongue. Uh, I don't think either uh, Richard Stallman has learned that lesson or is capable of learned that, learning that lesson. I do not know. Um, but I think it's the correct decision for him to step down so that those comments are, are not associated with the, the projects that he was the former lead of. I, I think the, the, I just want to make one little quick correction. Uh, Linus, when he announced that he was taking hiatus, it was never stepping down. He was just taking a break for a month and he was going to come back and he did announce that he was coming back. There was the misconceptions that he was like actually leaving the project, but it was just taking a break so that he could, you know, kind of rethink the situation that he's in and see what he could do about it. So I think that is the way that that's why I wanted to just address that part. I think we should take him as he is. And I think the society, we probably just had it towards that he's done some bad things, he's done some good things. We shouldn't forget the good, and we should, if possible, help him to figure out why he's done bad, and then obviously help the people uh, that were affected negatively by him to deal with it, because that's the worst thing there. Like, you know, yeah, he's an ass, but there are also people who got hurt by this, and that's bad. Um, I think we'll move on then to the next thing on the list. Um, Mike, you also put this in. Uh, this, now this is, uh, very surprising. I, I read it and I was aghast. Patent trolls are after GNOME. So, yeah, they, they say the shot well, the, uh, image, uh, the image organization program on Linux, uh, breaches their wireless distribution system and method patent, which is essentially importing images yeah you know like uh, we were saying with stallman that we should be understanding and that there's uh, ways people can uh, change and maybe recover well these guns should fucking burn in hell uh, <laughs> no I'm, I'm obviously i'm obviously um exaggerating i don't believe anybody should burn anywhere but this is a company of lawyers who do not create anything, they hoard patents and they are trying to catch up people or companies and projects on uh, on patents that are very broadly defined. I don't understand the American legal system. It's It enables that. I can't, we don't, if I, we don't very often hear about this, or at least I don't remember hearing about this from other places in the world. So I think it's, it's, it's in the American legal system. It works, it works probably best. But the problem is that this is just low. You know, you, 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 you go after an open source project that, you know, no matter what you think about GNOME, they do work as much as they can for the betterment of society. They give us, the, many of them work for free and they give, uh, give us all of these wonderful things. So in my opinion, they make the world a better place. Whereas these lawyers, and I don't have anything against lawyers. Some of my best friends don't have anything against lawyers either. But, uh, <laughs> uh, these, these people are just trying to, squeeze them for some for, for, for money and I, I don't know I can't even believe it I can't even talk about it properly because that's just horrible Is, isn't it like uh, I, I heard this somewhere before that it's a it's a valid legal defense if you can uh, if you can say that wait a minute you haven't enforced this for what 25 30 years um, it's a very old patent apparently and yeah it's like, it's like well you haven't you haven't sued all these other software companies that have used this and you haven't enforced it for X amount of time. So therefore you've lost your right to, to litigate basically. I've, I have heard that's the case. Uh, I, I think that's the reason why um, certain companies like uh, Disney, Oracle and a few others is if they have patents and if you're deemed to impeach upon them, then they go after you. They enforce it. 
So you got you guys are kind of referring to like you're right, but it's not about patents that are doing it. Uh, those are referred to copyright law and trademark law. So patent law is, is a different s- a subset. So like the copyright law is what Disney is has ruined basically because they didn't want to get rid of Mickey Mouse control. And they may they it used to be a certain amount of time that was like fifty years from the creation of the thing. Now it's seventy year five years after the death of the person who created it. So that's why Disney still owns Mickey Mouse because they basically ruined copyright law. And uh, trademark law is when you don't if you don't defend your trademark, you lose your trademark if you knowingly allow someone to violate it. And you don't do anything about it. If you're not aware of it and then they violate it, that's different. But if you know for a fact and you they basically allow them to do it. So you might not lose the trademark depending on what you do. But you once you allow them, you can't sue them. Whereas patents are only valid for a certain amount of time. So after a certain time period, they go into public domain. So it depends on how long that is. Uh, so, But yes, I do actually agree that the, the U.S. law structure for patents is... Uh, pretty much abysmal. It's just, it's terrible. They, they, they're structured to allow these patent troll companies to exist. And they set it up where like software patents don't really even make any sense for them to exist because they're just, they're just essentially ideas. They're not, they're not patenting the code. They're patenting the idea of how to make that code work. And that's, that's how it's ridiculous. Anyway, um, we should move on. Um, Zoran 15 education edition is out. Uh, Mike, you also put, you're on a run today, Mike. You also put this in. Yeah. Um, so how is this for a hat trick? Uh, basically, it's, uh, Zorin 15 has been out for a while. They've, uh, now put out the, the education edition that I think is freely downloadable. You know, with Zorin, uh, you can now either download, I think they call it the core, which is for free, or there is a paid version. And then there is the education version that has got basically software for uh, learning for all uh, age groups. And uh, it's a really neat idea that uh, if you if you get if you get uh, kids or students, as I said, of any age and uh, give them a really, really slick looking distro that is easy to use. Uh, I think that can help them learn and, uh, you know, if they, if they get this taste of Linux, if they don't, uh, if they don't want to go any deeper, they still have got a very easy to use distribution. If they want to, you know, then, uh, get hooked on Linux and, uh, start, uh, start, you know, digging deeper, they can, uh, they can, uh, go anywhere from there. So this really, I think this is really nice. And I'm glad to see, uh, Zorin, the Zorin guys going, going strong, uh, and releasing uh, these really slick looking releases. Yeah, I also really like the fact that this is a, a something that was needed because the if, if you're not aware, there's this distro that used to exist that did the same thing, and it was based on Ubuntu, but it was called Edubuntu, and so it was, you know, so the educational Ubuntu, and they they just they pretty much, I think they they were they went dormant for a few years, and then they completely just closed the project uh, a couple of years ago. And so we only had like a few here and there, like uh, projects to kind of do something about this. I think there are now a couple that are doing this, but it's really nice to see that they're, you know, Zorn's trying to do a polished approach to it. So they're making it like just a single package you can get. And uh, that's nice because it's, it's something that we used to have and now we have it again. And that's great because, you know, right now the other option is Chrome OS and who wants that? Um, once I, I will say that, um, Zorn OS is, is very sleek. It's very polished. It's, uh, I believe it's based off the uh, Ubuntu LTS, and and any videos that I've seen of it, uh, or any time that I've run it in a VM, it does just have those that extra layer of polish um, from everything from the the boot up splash screen to um, just artwork, their own custom artwork. Uh, I believe they have their own. Um, start page when you open up Firefox that has their own customized version of a web web search uh, that's on there. It's all themed, which is, it's all very, it's all very good. It's very, all very attractive. Um, and th- this is very good. That just means that they're able to just be able to roll this out into classrooms, um, and spread the word of the, of the good stuff that is Linux. Yeah, I actually like, uh, I think Zorin does a lot of cool stuff. Like the, the fact that they, they put so much effort in the polish is really nice. Uh, for like one, the Zorin Connect thing. Have y'all heard of that one? 
because it's like yeah, it's like KDE Connect, but they rebranded it and made it Soren Connect because the because they use GNOME Shell. I don't know why they use GNOME Shell because it's, it doesn't even look anything like GNOME. But um, mm-hmm. okay, so they use GNOME Shell, and in order to get KDE Connect to work, you have to install an Android app that's KDE Connect, install mm-hmm. the indicator stuff, and install the like the uh, the daemon that's AD, KDE Connect on the system, and then also a GS Connect shell extension. And then, the, and that's so complicated. They were like, you know, let's just make a Zorn Connect fork, and we'll just all we're going to do is just change the branding just to make it simple. And then that makes it way easier to, to explain to people how you set it up. You just use the Zorn Connect to Zorn Connect. It's like, yes, that's a really good way to do it. That's that's cool. That's cool. I actually didn't know that, and because uh, I, I've I haven't been exposed to Zorn OS myself, so. But that's amazing because the the brief time I tried KDE, I did like the idea of KDE Connect. But as you said, going through that process was a little was a little uh, taxing uh, because I got it working eventually. But I I don't know it it it, it took me a little while to figure out because I I wasn't even sure uh, how how to install a GNOME shell extension because that's just not something I've ever used. Yeah. Well, KDE Connect is is great if you use it on KDE. It's built in by default and it's like this smooth, seamless thing. But when you want to use it for other thing for other DEs, you can use it on any DE you want. But it only works smooth and uh, flawlessly about at the box with Plasma. So you have to do extra things in order to get it work on other DEs, which it totally will work. It just takes a little bit of effort, especially with like GNOME. You have to know that you need this other thing that's not even called KD Connect and you know, all that stuff. I've used it before on non um, KD uh, DEs. Um, for example, I'm running Cinnamon at the moment, um, and I've, I've installed it here. I just I just tend to have my phone with me, so if there's a notification or something like that, um, if it's urgent, then my uh, my phone will will go off. Um, if it's not urgent, then I'll get back to it whenever I want. Um, the idea of replying to something off my off my screen off my computer rather than replying to something off my phone that um just doesn't suit my work my workflow but i can definitely see the appeal in it so later in the show we're going to talk about kde we're going to get back to that because kde connect is a thousand times more but more awesome than that like that's just one little feature that it has it's got so many others we'll get to that later (laughs) can't wait uh connor Finally, you have a news story to tell us about. Um, XFCE 4.14 released. Uh, do you want to tell us about that? So, um, <laughs> this is not exactly new news, but, uh, bear with us. We've, we've been on, been on a break for a while. Yeah. XFCE have finally come out with a new version. And the news is that it's now, um, been ported over to GTK 3. Um, and many more, more other things which you'll be able to read, read about in their announcement. Um, yeah, it's, it's, an uh, it's, it's very good. And, uh, from videos that I've seen of it, it looks quite slick. I mean, if, if I wasn't checking out KDE for this episode, I was, I, I was definitely thinking, Genie, uh, the XFC might be the one, my next one to check out. Um, it's uh, XFC is kind of very lightweight, and now that it has the GTA three support, possibly Wayland support, I haven't. Uh, it's, as I said, it's it's something on my list to check out. I've not actually checked it out yet. Um, but fair play to them. And as far as I'm aware, they're saying they're going to uh, try to be more frequent with their releases, as XFC is notoriously long in the tooth between their releases so they're saying that they will try to do more timely predictable releases so fair play to them yeah i think the xfc is great that they're doing this and they did take a little while but they did say that they're going to be trying to do uh once a year releases they you know best of luck there but uh, they did say that that's what their goal is. And I think this is actually a fantastic thing that they've done. They've actually made it in much improvements to like the multi monitor support and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's great. And also they do have a little bit of Wayland support, but it's not like full Wayland support. Uh, thanks to the GTK makes it possible to do Wayland much, much easier. Uh, they also have like, in, like things that are, they're still working on to the future releases to more, give more polish to those things. Like this one is like a full, like base core 
switch to GTK3, which is a ton of work. That's one of the biggest difference between this release and the other release was like three and a half years or so, just because of how much work doing that toolkit change is. Uh, so it does make sense, but you know, it'd be really nice to get more updates from XFC because you know, it's always nice to get more stuff. I like, I like new and shiny. Who doesn't? Um, next up, uh, Connor, you added the Librem 5. $699 Linux phone has started shipping to backers. So the controversial thing about this is that they have set so many uh, goalposts for them, or so many deadlines, and they've blown through most of the deadlines. And the latest one that they've they've they stated in order to technically hit this deadline what they're doing is they're kind of they're setting out uh, something that's a bit more advanced than a, just a development kit but it's kind of uh, it'll be hardware with with kind of a loose fitting case and um like it won't be fully fully um seamless oh, I'll start again <laughs> Sorry. So the con the controversial thing about this is that they have set several deadlines for themselves, and uh, there was probably a danger of them missing this current deadline. But in order to just about make this deadline, what they've done is they they're releasing out essentially something a bit more advanced than a dev kit. But they're saying that the it will come in a case that might be hand assembled. The like mightn't have the the full polish that you're expecting from a full um OEM release of a phone um just to get the into that deadline but they've said that there's there you can we can wait hold off and we'll ship it out when we've refined the production of the phone having said that I'm all for their goals I'm all for a, a fully open source and freedom respecting as much as they can mobile device and I know that people such as the Pine Pine um, 64 with their Pine book or Pine phone are doing something very similar so kudos to them for the idea but I don't think their implementation is is that is that great but with them meeting, missing their deadlines but uh more com more competition is good in this is in this uh, Linux phone market, and fair play to them for at least attempting to release a device. We shall have to see um, the feedback on the the final shipped devices. Well, if I were to be cynical about this, I would say that this is an ancient hardware in terms of mobile phones, shipping late, not very well put together for the price of uh, the new OnePlus Seven T or whatever, right? Uh, I haven't had a chance to play with it. I didn't. Uh, there is a video of them. There is a video of them uh, showcasing a bit of the software, not very much. I um, didn't obviously have the chance to play with it myself, so I can't say how well the software works. I hear that they themselves say that the that the hardware is not f like fully, not even polished. Just it's all easily fitting well together. So. It is asking a lot from from their supporters or from their backers for a lot of money. You don't get very much. And what they are at this point selling, I believe, is an idea and a following, right? I think. But then I remember about, I don't know, five years ago, as I was listening to some or other Linux podcast, Riding my bike uh, from from uh, from work, listening to a podcast, just uh, not very happy with the with the pine with the sorry with the with the Librem laptop that he received because it was shipping late, didn't have all the promised features, and it was uh, it was uh, not very well. Not that, not that very, not, not, not very well put together, but it wasn't working very well. I think there were fans were just constantly going on. And so I think that in this case, it's already a tradition. Now, you know, I don't want to defend this, but that's how they do it. So they, they take 
a lot from the first backers, and I believe that maybe in five years there is a decent font in there for, for, for us. Because if you are willing to pay for the premium, at this point, if you buy some of their laptops, and we had uh, one of uh, we had a guy at our uh, Dublin Linux meetup uh, bring in a laptop from them once, they are decent pieces of hardware. Pieces of hardware they cost a lot of money for what you get. But they have some nice features and they really look good. And by this time, everything is nice, really nice and polished. So I believe that in five years, we will have a decent phone from them. But in order for them to ha- to make it happen, the only way they seem to know how to do this is by taking a lot from the people who beg them at, at first. So if you are if you are supporting them now, you are basically enabling them to do the stuff that will be decent later. One thing I will say is, um, I know I was, I was giving them a bit of, uh, good credit for just the sake of them releasing an, an uh, a free and open source respecting device. Um, but the way they hand, they're handling it, I don't think is, is anyway, it's a good situation. I, I actually prefer the way the, the Pine64 are doing it with their Pine phone as it's a low cost device. Um, they have the attitude of, here are all the updates. It will release when it's ready. Uh, we're not setting deadlines. Um, and also low expectations as in when you get the device, uh, it is what it is. There won't be any, like, they're giving the attitude of there won't be any, uh, warranty. There won't be, uh, because it's such a low cost, cost device, like warranty, customer support, that sort of things. Don't they be expecting it from this, um, device? So they're, it's going to it's going to get more people because it's such a low um low powered device uh it's going to be open so there's going to, there's already four or five different distributions like post market os sailfish os have been ported over to it um uh luna os which i think is a con- is a continuation of the old web os um is absolutely fantastic so i think that the pine approach is definitely the correct way to do it the reason why i was giving librem credit on this was competition is good essentially um wish them the best and look i do not think their their approach is going to is going to get them any uh, a lot of goodwill but who knows yeah so you mentioned pine 64 there and it's interesting because uh, if you want to weigh up the approaches of pine 64 and librem I mean, Pine64 are definitely winning on that front. I mean, you release a phone that suits its price point and is open and hackable. It doesn't need to be powerful and therefore doesn't need to be expensive. So, yeah, it's it's all about the philosophy, of, ph- sorry, philosophy behind the device and, you know, punching, punching at your weight class. I mean, don't promise the heaven and earth and then not deliver it. It's better, it's better to, you know, promise something basic, but promising. And then, oh God, promise twice. It's, it's better to, yeah, but it is, it's better to promise something deliverable and then deliver it you mean at a reasonable price. Under promise and over deliver. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's, we're not getting it because it's like state of the art hardware. We're getting it because it's a fucking Linux phone. It's like, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, it doesn't need, I don't care. I don't even want a screen. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the interesting thing about this is that the lead, the, I think the problem with Purism's approach is that they're just not honest because they're saying that we shipped it. We met our shipping date. Like, no, you didn't. This is an engineering sample. It's not complete. That's not meeting your shipping date. The shipping date would be when they actually complete it, when they ship the Evergreen version, which will be in quarter two of next year. That will be when the phone's actually done, and then that's when it's complete. So that's the actual date. There you go. Uh, Pine64 is doing something that is interesting because it, it's it's something that really Purism can't do. So one, I'll give I'll give credit to Purism in that they're trying to do this. Uh, and Pine64 is, is in a space where they can deal with small chips and they can deal with small products and they can do it quickly and easily. Not necessarily quickly, but they've been working on this for years, but in the sense that it seems like they can do it for such a low cost because they're basically doing it at cost. Like there's a little bit extra margin just to make sure that they can facilitate paying their employees and stuff like that. But they're not doing a hard, uh, like a really high price because 
they have all this other stuff with the system on the chip boards, the competitor, the Raspberry Pi, all that other stuff that they're doing. So they have a, an easier in in that approach, whereas Purism is basically just stepping into a mobile market that they have no experience in whatsoever. So I understand why the price is different, but the hardware isn't that much different. Like they are very similar hardware. They're definitely the, the Librem is going to be more powerful, but not that much more powerful and definitely not $550 more powerful. Like, so it's just kind of like this weird situa- situation where purism does these things that are like, they're acting like they're doing something that they're not really doing. And I think that one of the issues that really is the, probably the biggest thing is that people are spreading this thing about a fully open source phone. It's not, at all fully open source. Like the hardware is not even close to fully open source. It's not even possible legally for them to allow it to do that because there's certifications and there's legal requirements that they're not even allowed to do so in order to meet their requirements for having phones that are using certain frequencies and that kind of thing. So they, they, they don't necessarily come out and say that they're fully open source, but things that, you, you know, blog posts and stuff like that and like people who they are sponsoring will say that they do, that it is, and they don't correct it. So that's another issue that they're doing because it's not the amount of openness that they have is basically the same as the Pine 64 stuff. The, the difference is that they're doing more of a modular style, which is cool because you can replace the CPU and stuff like that. I like the idea that they're going to do that, but that doesn't mean it's open source. Yeah, it's a good point on the uh, the chips, like especially I, I think it's called the baseband and all that kind of. Like you said, the yeah, if you want to use the network, you have you can't open source that. Yeah, so that's that's a valid point. So it's it's definitely all about the software, really. Yeah, and also just um, to be clear, Pine sixty four is also separating the baseband, so you get the same benefit from them too. Uh, and I think the the issue with the cost, I think they they really just bit off more than they can chew because they are building their own operating system that is a mobile operating system with a toolkit and a layout that is not meant to be a mobile operating system. So they have to do all this work. And that's just such a huge task that if they weren't doing the non-invented here thing and they just did a bunch of touch or something else, it would have been a lot easier approach. And that's really how Pine64 is going to be successful is because they're they're not they, because they, they can be cheaper so much because yes, they have the input to the manufacturers and that stuff, but they're also not trying to make their own operating system. They're just using ones that exist. Well, it's called leveraging, not even leveraging. It's called being part of the community. They give us uh, something that we can afford and that we want. And those of us who are willing and who want to uh, develop for this kind of a platform have the opportunity. It's It, it makes... It's it's like, I don't know, don't want to sound like a business douche, but it's enriching the ecosystem. And uh, I think I I think that's something that um uh Pine do, the Raspberry Pi Foundation do the similar thing when they basically giving us a product, but it also makes us feel part of something and actually, you know, kind of feedback to it whereas companies like let's say apple or uh and i might suspect that this could be a librem thing as well they come on from high and say receive this from us for high money and you kind of you you don't feel that much part of the at least i don't and it might be different for people who are really invested into into librem but i don't feel as much like surround like i don't feel that librem are as much a part of a community as uh for example, Pine uh, sixty four are or most other open source projects to be for the for for the matter. Yeah, I would actually argue that that's there's likelihood that this will be a negative reputational thing for the community because people will be like, oh, there's this new Linux phone, and everybody's talking about how this Linux phone is so great, and then they they look at it, they see the price. If they don't know hardware, they might not look at it, but they, they see the hardware and then they realize that this is not for those people. This is an enthusiast phone, but it doesn't have an enthusiast price. It has a premium mainstream price on it. And that is why I think that the reason why I like the Pine 64 people is that they're more direct to what they're doing, but also they're more, they, they realize the people who they're going for are the people who want something to, that because they want this Linux phone and the next version could be better than that. But to have a premium is just too much at this point. 
So, on to the discussion. And I have a very inflammatory question for all of you. Um, I want a very brief opinion on KDE. Connor, you go first. Um, very polished. Um, have they have a lot of their their own apps? Which uh, like the the design is absolutely beautiful and breathtaking. It's very polished. They have their own apps. Um, a little too heavy on the on the options and the customizability for me, but that's just my own personal opinion. Uh, for me, as soon as I can get it working as reliable as GNOME, I'm switching. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's very brief. Um, my opinion is I don't know uh, because I used it for a number of weeks. I switched fully to it just to get a sense of it, but uh, couldn't put my finger on what I didn't like. But I was I was back on GNOME within a month. Uh, not to say it's a bad desktop environment. I just think it's not for me. It's it, yeah. It's not. It's not my. It's not my bag, baby. Now, Michael. Okay, so to keep it brief, it's the best. <laughs> Into the show. Thanks for everybody for listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was promised. <laughs> uh, so, uh, just just to maybe we skipped we skimmed over this. Uh, Michael, what is your like affiliation with KD? If you have any, or like. Obviously, those of us who listened to a lot of Linux podcasts, we know that you are a big, I don't want to say advocate or maybe enthusiastic user, but do you have any other like ties to the project other than uh, just really loving it? It's mostly informal, but I have done a lot of int- uh, contributions to KDE over the years, and uh, a lot of the new stuff that's coming in the 517, I had a hand in in some way. Um, and, and, you know, not necessarily big things, but there's a lot of like things that I've been talking to the developers for quite a few years, trying to get them to change certain things. And then sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. That's just, you know, any open source project. Uh, but I have been, uh, much more in contribution to Kubuntu and the, the difference between uh, Kubuntu and a regular plasma distros is, I think, very drastic. And I think for the better by far. So for anybody who wants, before we get to the actual meat of the discussion, before we get to the actual piece, I would say that if you are interested in checking out Plasma, then you should first start with Kubuntu. Even if you're not an Ubuntu fan, start with Kubuntu because they change uh, everything that I think needs to be changed by default. So the experience is more user friendly and more user focused rather than the defaults of plasma, which they try to do of what they think that this is just superior, regardless of what the users would it think. And I think that's a, uh, that's the biggest issue. So uh, yes, I promote plasma, but I promote Kubuntu as the first thing that you should try if you haven't tried plasma in a long time or ever. So there's that. Uh, but if we want to talk about the things that you're saying, like uh, you said that you you haven't really uh, you don't really have like Shane, you said you don't have a a, a really a grasp on like what you don't like about it. And I would just have a question. My question is, is it related to having to change a lot of things really quickly? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I think that the first thing that pops into my head that I didn't like was that I almost had too many options. Um, so at, at first glance, that seemed really great. And I, I loved how, how it surfaced the configurability, but, uh, it, it started to kind of stress me out after a few hours because I was like, I can change so many things. And then an hour later, I was like, I can change so many things. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get that. So what, what, what distro did you drive for it? I, I went. I went full KDE. I went uh, KDE Neon. Okay. So uh, I would suggest people, you should try it as well, uh, Kubuntu. And the reason is because um, it's definitely a little self-serving, but I contributed (laughs) a lot to the Kubuntu uh, 1804 release. And there's been a lot of changes that make Kubuntu not as so cumbersome and overwhelming in the beginning. So the biggest issue I felt was that when you start using KDE Plasma, you, you're, you're sitting to a position where there's so many things that are just not natural 
that don't make sense why they're default, but they are default. So you have to go in and change those things yourself. And that just creates this thing experience where in order to use plasma within the first 10, 15 minutes, you're like, well, I got to change this thing because, well, it's kind of ridiculous. And whereas Kubuntu has all that stuff already changed so that it's a lot less of a headache or a lot less overwhelming because most of it you, you would want to change is already changed. Yeah. I mean, it's probably just, uh, my, my desktop environment history. I mean, when I started out, of course it was GNOME because I think that's everyone's gateway drug. Um, I could be wrong, but I think, I think I'm not, uh, then K X yeah, XFCE, I used Zubuntu for the longest time, probably the longest I've used any distro. Well, no, Mint probably is longer, but, but yeah, I've used like GNOME, Cinnamon, XFCE, uh, LXDE for about 15 minutes. Um, and, uh, I can't really think of any others. So I think I've just been locked into this mode. If you like, uh, I have an I have an opinion on what a desktop environment should be, and KDE was just a little too different to that from for for my liking. Um, I, I I stop short of saying KDE is a bad desktop environment because it isn't because like it, right, lo it's it awesome. looks very nice. Yeah, it looks very nice. It has a lot of features. Uh, a lot of things impressed me about it. Um, you know, I think it had a lot of advantages over GNOME or XFCE, uh, uh, etc. But yeah, yeah. So I think it's just an opinion. It's yeah. not a judgment. Yeah, I think that that Plasma's issue is that, and I think Plasma's fundamental problem of people experiencing is that one, it doesn't. The defaults are not the best. I mean, some of them are are, are just not very good, and some are just outright ridiculous. Um, but then I think the biggest issue is that the to really like plasma, you have to put in it more time than most people want to do because the fundamental pieces, like the core of plasma is so impressive that once you start utilizing it and seeing how much it can do and how easily it can do these things, then that is how it brings you into being a fan. Like when I, I used to use plasma every once in a while, and even back when it wasn't even called plasma, like back in the KDE three days, I would use it, but never really love it. Like I never really gave it the time that it needed because it requires uh, it's, if you get the, the, the default the experience just definitely requires a lot of dealing with stuff. So the situation where I started with my plasma experience was uh, many, many years of going, well, yeah, this is great. It has so many cool features, but it looks like it looks garbage. This was before plasma five, which it did look like garbage before um, there, yeah. Uh, and then there was also, there's a bunch of issues where these features were so hidden. You wouldn't, wouldn't even know they were there and they still have that problem, but there are so many awesome features. I can give you a list of how cool this stuff is, but, uh, the, the, the biggest problem is that in order to like plasma, you have to know that that stuff is there. I'm kind of, my problem is that I, I really want to like, be part of it for fear of sounding a bit silly but basically you know you you read your linux news and uh, plasma is always out there look what you do what we do this week and how uh you know and they say uh we are helping everybody who wants to contribute to us here is the landing page and we've got a new website and we re redesign these applications and look how we develop and everything's in the open it's a really cool sounding project you know every you know that is not you know you, you hear about other projects that there's uh Maybe, uh, maybe a bit heavy handed approach. You know, this is trying to be very inclusive. And I really love all those news that are coming out of it, uh, coming out of, out of the Plasma project. And I want to be part of it. So I go and install it and I install Kubuntu. And the first thing I want to do on any install, any environment is swap control and alt. And it's the problem with this. I, I think as far as I managed to think about, uh, to, to get to think about it is, that there are at least two places where you can do. Uh, no, sorry, not not swapping control and all. That's easy. But uh, basically, having super key tab switch in my Windows, and if if you do it in one, if the Windows switcher it kind of breaks everything, and you can never go get the Windows switch working. At least in my experience, there is another place where you can do that, and it and that kind of uh, that kind of works. Then 
I overcame this by by basically using the other place to to, to switch it. I I thought, okay, I go to the landing page. I'm not a developer, but maybe when they say that you can become one, I can, I can I can see how how much I can do because it will be really cool. And there is a there is a really nice guy that tells you download Plasma uh, and build it using all of these commands. I can't get it to work, <laughs> and I usually get things to work, which is frustrating to me. So I post it on the forum. Uh, I got I got a reply, but by the time, and I'm not that kind of a guy to go out on uh, like R- IRC chats and just uh, trying to. I know that there's mentors, but I don't want to bother anybody because I don't know if I'm going to stick with this. So I I I I really want to try, and I really want to use Plasma, but because of these little snags, when I go when I go back to work and then and I don't want to have to deal with, with these issues. My my install at work is, is going to be GNOME until I can switch. Then I can I I kind of I really like the project. So as soon as I manage to get even if it requires work on my part, but I would have to I I need to be confident that I can fix stuff before I start like before I jump fully into it. And uh, it's been kind of difficult in my in my in my experience with KDE. So my approach to KDE, particularly for um, the new uh, Plasma Five, I mean, I I agree with what Michael said that it was just it was just, uh, I wouldn't say ugly, but it wasn't so much polished and it was kind of a hot mess in terms of the design on the KDE. You're right; uh, it's not ugly; pre- it's hideous. <laughs> KDE four at previous days, KDE five. Is absolutely beautiful. I'll, I'll give them that with their default, um, Breeze team. When they first started, uh, teasing it, it was around the time, um, I, I, I'm not sure which came first, but it was around the time when, uh, Windows was teaming their, or was teasing their Windows, t- uh, 10 UI and design. And I was looking at them side by side and I says, uh, I was th- I literally was thinking that the, KD UI design and their default theme in terms of sharpness and the design of the icons and everything was on par with, with Windows 10, if not exceeding it, just from the pure design point of view. Um, so kudos for them from that, from that point of view. Um, and the, sure, uh, as soon as they released it, there was, uh, of the early KD five days weren't the most uh, stable or user friendly, but fair play to them. They're just refining it, refining it, and refining it. So it's definitely in my top three um, in terms of desktop environments. I will also echo some of Shane's points of it is a little overwhelming when it comes to uh, the when you open up the configuration menus and so on. Um, th- that is, I'm not saying. I don't know if they're actually going to do this, but it would be the simplest thing to to solve would be have all a toggle they'll say, do you want a simple settings or advanced settings and have some sort of toggle or some sort of UI way of switching between the two. Um, and then each di- uh, distribution can choose which they want to display by default. Um, whether it's Kubuntu, maybe want a, a sim- the simple one by default, or something like uh, Manjaro KDE, or something like that, or Fedora KDE, um, the KDE version of Fedora might want the advanced one by default, or uh, OpenSUSE, which um, also has a, uh, ships with KDE uh, by default, I believe, or um, could be wrong on that one, but it certainly have their a very good implementation of KDE. They might want the advanced one by default, but the simplest thing in the in the world just have a UI switcher between the two. Mm-hmm. You actually make a good point. I, I will address both um, uh, Connor and Mike about. Uh, their comments like back to back. Uh, first, I'm mean, going to just because it's brief, it's in my mind right now. So, the uh, Connor, the switcher for the, uh, the different interface, simple and advanced, has been suggested for about a decade. And uh, who knows? Maybe they listen to podcasts and will actually listen to people saying, hey, we want this because everyone wants this, KDE. Everyone, yeah. <laughs> even the people who are okay with the advanced, want this. So, uh, there's, there's, it's definitely as I think it's great that Plasma has all these features, but they shouldn't be promoting it by default of all these things because not everybody wants to deal with all that stuff. 
Um, so like the GNOME way is to have all, like a nice layout. And if you want to go advanced, you go into G settings. Like that is a better way of doing it because the advanced people are going to get the advanced tools. Now I do like how so easy it is for uh, doing advanced things in plasma, but that shouldn't be the default experience for everyone because most people don't even want to deal with that stuff. Uh, and Mike, you're talking about how you wanted to contribute to it. And I think that, that some of the things that you were saying are basically a reflection of what I've said in my experience anyway, maybe not even what I've said, but just my experience of going to developers on KDE and saying, Hey, would you do this kind of thing? And then them telling me, and that's just really easy. Here's the documentation to do it yourself. And my response to that is I'm a designer. I can give you design tips. I can give you experience usage, how to make everything work well, but not the actual part of making it work well. And that happens so often that it becomes a part where like, well, who, who are you expecting to actually contribute? Because if they only want developers, just come out and say you only want developers. Uh, but it's really hard to, you know, gauge that part. But in terms of getting someone, you know, you said that you, you, they have mentors and stuff like that. And that's really cool. They do, but they also, um, they should have people who are community mentors, I would say, in the sense of like, here's the way I started using plasma. I was very hesitant. I was the guy who was like, <sighs> I will go ahead and admit it. I said that plasma was bloated for a very long time. It was not true. Still isn't true. Never was true. There was a bug in one release in like the 4.3 days that gave it its reputation. But for since then, it would, it just had a massive problem. Uh, but it's not actually true. It's very lean. You can put it on 512 megs of RAM. It's very lean. I mean, I don't do that. I'm not suggesting do that. That's not a good idea, but you can do that. And that's all I'm saying. So what I was saying is that when I got uh, into plasma is because someone who was already into plasma convinced me with a argument for about an hour of saying like, here, here's the reasons you should check it out. I was like, yeah, whatever. That's not good enough. And then they, they kept going and going. Then they said something that I've said repeatedly. That is the reason why I was like, okay, I'm going to try it. If I can do something that weirdly specific, that is so is beneficial. I'm going to check it out and see what else it can do. And uh, the co the conversation was we were having we were talking about games and my game crashed and he was like you know plasma could take care of that. It's like what does that mean? Well, you know ever you ever played a game and then it didn't full screen it doesn't work very well but so you switch to window mode and it works flawlessly because it's not it's not dealing with the compositing problems and stuff. There's a feature in plasma so you auto hide your panels. You go you maximize the window and then you right click the title bar, go to more options uncheck the uh, the border section or, or check the no border section, it will remove all of the decorations on the window. And now you have a full screen that's not actually full screen. So it looks like a full screen, but it's more of a faux full screen. And that was like, wait, what? Why would that? Okay, I have to try that now. And so I go from some going to that and I said, okay, so I will be, I'll be fair to your request and say, I will check out Plasma. I will spend a full week in it and I will check it out. So that was five years ago. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> roughly, roughly five years ago. And I think that Plasma is fantastic, but it does take that kind of conversation to get someone to do it. And it shouldn't. Like Plasma has such, like, I think Plasma has the most potential of any DE because it is so powerful. But if they were just to look at the, like, just acknowledge the fact that it might be too powerful as a way to, to present it, that people just don't want to deal with that thing. Like, for example, you changing different configurations of your keyboard. It's actually not that hard to do, but if you don't know where to go to do it, it's a pain. Like, there are things you can do that are really cool just in this one section of this. You go into the system settings, then you go into the input section, then you go into the extra behaviors of the layout section, which is another tab inside the input section. And then uh, you've got to go into another section of that part. Then there you can make all these different configurations. You can disable caps lock. You can turn caps lock into do nothing at all. And if you still want to use caps lock, make both your ships at the same time become a caps lock. And then to turn off caps lock, you just hit one of them. There's ridiculous things like that that are available, but they're so buried in this is, you know, labyrinth of features that 
it, it kind of does a disjust an injustice to itself. I, 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 I get that. Like, I love that feature when you, when you can, uh, you know, my caps lock is actually an escape, uh, because, you know, Vim rules supreme. But, uh, I think I've heard you, and this is related. I've heard you saying somewhere that you reconfigure your, uh, uh, plasma to suit a gnome like workflow. Now, I really like the gnome workflow because, you know, the, I, I, even, so my, the first time, whenever I tr- want to try plasma, one of the first things that I sometimes try is to change that, uh, menu into a dash or proper dash, as I call it, because, you know, the, so y- how did you, what, what do you do? How do you customize your plasma and what do you, how okay. do you achieve that? So this is the thing about like with that, when I first started using Plasma, I was a GNOME user. I was actually a maintainer of multiple extensions, like 12 to fit 14 extensions at the time. Uh, so I was really heavily into development of GNOME and using GNOME and all that stuff. So I really liked the workflow. When I went to Plasma, I don't, and I don't like the Windows paradigm. I don't want to use it. I, it's, I, I, I'm away from Windows for a couple reasons. One of which I don't like how to use their system. So I didn't want something that looked and worked like Windows. And, uh, th- then when I sw- switched to it, I did the, the GNOME style and I recreated the GNOME style. And I've done it many times in different ways, but my favorite way is the new, in my new way. And it's so nice. So you're speci- specifically talking about having a dock. There is a dock in Plasma called the Latte dock, and it is the greatest dock ever made. It is more than a dock. It is a way of life. Okay, that's a little bit too much. That might be too much. It's a way of computing for sure. Uh, so I replace every panel on my system with a Latte dock because the panel system is very, it's powerful, but also very limited in many ways. So Latte dock has this really cool feature where you can turn the dock into a panel and every single widget in every plasmoid that you can use, by the way, widgets and plasmoids are basically the same thing. They just have different names for some reason. Uh, the, every widget that is available in a plasma panel is also available in a latte dock. So you can do anything you can, you want to with the latte dock and build it however you want. You can have different configurations. Like mine looks like GNOME. It works like GNOME. It has like a dash left, uh, uh, dock sort of has the panel at the top, has the, even the, the clock is in the middle, just like GNOME. And I have my event calendar right where the, the clock is and all that stuff. Like it's very similar to the style of GNOME, but it is doing it through the power of plasma. And the reason is because I prefer my, by the way, my default suggestion is not to for that for plasma to change it to the GNOME workflow, do whatever you want. But my preference is that style because I just, I think it's more efficient and just more elegant in the, in the way they structured it. But it's not very easy to do in regular plasma. Latte doc makes it so easy and so simple that you can even set up how, set the panels how you want. So the docs, how you want, then save the configuration. And you can, when you re, if you reinstall or whatever, you can just import the configuration. It goes right back exactly where it was. There's so many really nice things about that that, uh, that's how I do it. And I'll, I'll show you, like, I should make a video like explaining how I actually do it. Uh, but Ryan from destination Linux did a video where he took my secrets and, um, he got a couple things wrong, but for the most part, he took my secrets and made a thing. And one of the things is he shows how latte doc does some certain things. So, uh, I'll send you the link to that video if you'd like it. Uh, Michael, while you were speaking there, uh, I detected the same enthusiasm in your voice for latte doc as I got from gnome tweak. So, and we're talking, mm-hmm. we're talking two wildly yeah. different things here. Yeah. But basically you don't need a gnome tweak. You don't need a tweak tool in plasma because plasma itself is the tweak tool. So, so there's something else that you would want to have that. And like latte doc is this thing where it's so impressive and it's, I'm pretty sure it's made by one person and at least the one person maintains everything. He might have other contributions, but it's a lot of work and it does a lot of cool stuff. Like it even has like nice, fancy polish things. So like you, it, maybe you want, you want a panel, but you want that panel to be like, um, the panel in, ele- in elementaries where it's like transparent. And then when you move something to the top and it like becomes opaque, it has that feature as well. Like it has such a really nice layout and it's so smooth to do things. One of the most annoying things about the plasma panel is that if you want to center something in the panel, you can't. Because you can't automatically do a spacer. They have a flexible spacer, but it just takes up whatever space there might be. So even if you have two uh, flexible spacers on the side, 
you have no idea what's going to happen. It's, uh, it's never going to actually center it. Whereas the latte doc just has the structure is like center this way. And you're like, okay, great. Perfect. No problem. Uh, that kind of thing is where, is why I like it. Cause they make it so much easier. And, uh, that's not how plasma works, but Hey, I can certainly see how exciting all these things would be. I mean, and you know, this is the t kind of talk that got me interested in trying KDE initially because I remember there was one thing in Ubuntu 18.04 where, or no, sorry, 18.10, where I was really frustrated that I couldn't just click to minimize on the, the panel icons. So, you know, click to minimize and then you just click and it minimizes and maximizes like you would expect in anything else. And I was just kind of frustrated that I had to go get a terminal command that does that, like that enables it. Mm -hmm. So... I, yeah, Plasma has that ability as well, but also you can you can even do uh, control click, new instance, or middle click with your mouse with the scroll wheel and close the close the application. Well, that's serious. <laughs> See, that's the thing. Like, there's a certain level of complexity that I appreciate, but it's like law of diminishing returns after a certain point. But that's the thing about Plasma is great, and it, basically anything you could think of that you wanted to do in some way, it can do it. It might be a little clunky to learn how to do these things, but it can pretty much do almost everything you can think of. And that's why I think plasma is the most, has the most potential because it has so much power. It's just their, their polish needs a lot of work. Like the way the th the themes look, the way the icons look, they're pretty good. Like I don't have much to s negative things to say about that. It's just the experience itself by default. It, it, it needs work. Uh, like for example, there's a, you know, when you, when you open, when you open the overview in GNOME, you just hit the super key and it's everything. Your windows are there. Everything's there. Now you can't really do that in plasma yet. Uh, there's people working on that, but there, you can't do that yet. Uh, but there's a thing called present windows, which does the same kind of overlay of the windows, but just does the windows. Now, the weird thing about it is that the settings for that are so awkward for no reason. So if you hit the shortcut key, which is control F10. And if you just look on your keyboard, how ridiculous your hand has to be stretched to do that. Like that's just a ridiculous thing to do. And then on top of that, they have this setting called natural and natural means I have no idea. So if you have a full screen window, like you would assume that it's going to be laying out in a grid, kind of like how uh, Nome does it. But what they do is they pick random dimensions and positions and whatever. So you have like a full screen application. Well, that full screen application is right next to a vertical window that's only taking up, you know, a small percentage. It's a full uh, vertical uh, maximization, but it's only like maybe 20% the size. So when you actually open the present windows, the full screen is taking up 80% of the actual display. And then that little, that vertical thing is so small, you can barely even see it. And if you were to just change one setting to this thing called the regular grid, which ha, who thinks that regular grid would people want, they do, everybody wants that. And if, if you change it to that, it will be so much easier. It'll look exactly how you want it to be. And for some reason, that's not the default. It is going to be the default in Plasma and in Kubuntu's next release. So they are making changes like that kind of stuff. Because once I get them to change something that I think is significantly problem, and I was like, okay, now here's some little bitty things that I'm finding. This, uh, so this is the, for me, this is a comparison between, uh, GNOME and, uh, let's say, K and KD or other things for that matter. I, I think this is because there is a, there must be somewhere. I think part of it is the canonical Ubuntu desktop team who contribute to GNOME. And I'm sure there are other, uh, significant design, uh, like contributions from other places, but, for me personally, GNOME gets the things mostly right. So that's the when you know, when the way it presents windows, the way the windows snap, the, the the shortcuts. I think it might be that unfortunately Plasma doesn't have. It has got a very good community ecosystem, but doesn't have the commercial backing or the contribution from uh from like the the likes of canonical design team or i don't know if how many people from maybe fedora or even red hat work on on gnome uh is that something that uh do you see changing anytime or do you even agree with uh, this i would say yeah i would say quite briefly that uh, they may not have the as much of, fin of a financial backing but they do certainly have a financial backing 
Yes, they have a significant financial backing. They have a lot of the same companies are also contributing to the the KDE project as well. And they also have Blue Systems that's basically sole purpose is to benefit KDE. Uh, they also do other things like make calamares for installer for all those districts that use it. Uh, but they their biggest thing is that they contribute a lot to KDE. And most, most of the employees who work for Blue Systems are, are full-time employees for them. Actually, entire job is just to work on KDE. So they have a significant financial backing as well. But the I think the issue is that um, in my opinion, Gnome has the, like, they, they suffer from different problems. So, but Gnome is, it chose the problem that is the least visible. So they chose to make the experience, the front end stuff, the, the polish of it, the design, the focal point. They're making it easier to use. I mean, by the way, I don't really like, I think Edwaita needs to work, but hey, uh, the shell itself, it looks really nice and it's, it works quite well. And that is where they focused. But if you look at the technical merit of their code and the structure of the, like, all the times they're like, hey, we're removing these features that people want because our code is too cumbersome for us to continue to maintain it. And it's super old and it's whatever. Like there's, those are the reasons they get rid of features that people want, like a system tray. I mean, come on. So those are the things that they do. But they look at it as you look at most people who are not into the, the core structure of a DE don't like, which is most people, which don't look at, they look at it and go, yeah, that looks nice. It looks, you know, it's, it's smooth to use and all that stuff. When you look at plasma, if you look at the core structure of it, it is so impressive and it is so interesting and like it is so much better structurally. Like, for example, with plasma, it's basically completely modular in every way. They could easily do an, a simple system settings and an advanced system settings. All they have to do is not load certain modules and it wouldn't be as complicated. They could just load the modules that are the most, you know, simple to use and most things that were pe or first, you know, everybody needs a display and monitor section. So that would be included, but you don't need to go into every single facet of the system by, by default. So they could easily do that because it's so modular and so structured. And it's also more efficient because it's multi-threaded. It's got all these different, it uses Qt, which is super scalable. It has, it has like, it had a uh, high DPI support way before GNOME did. It had uh, support for so many different pieces that are just structurally easier for them to do because they structured it. They made it in a way that allows them to work on stuff in a more compartmentalized way, but still get that functionality that they want. Whereas like GNOME is a single threaded shell. So if it crashes, your display server has to compensate. And with X, X can compensate, but Wayland doesn't. So when you crash on Wayland, you just crash and it's not recoverable. You have to just reboot. And that's a lot of people have experienced that because of the single threaded system. So like, but most people experience the unpolished, like somewhat semi-polished, I guess, uh, design of, of plasma, but they don't, ex they experience the unpolished experience of plasma. And that creates this issue where people think that plasma is not as robust and as useful because they, they would assume that certain things would be like, why does this not work as the way it should be? Like, wh why are these things just more difficult for no reason? And that's pro that's pretty much the plasma problem. So KDE is some, but before we move on, I just want to say KDE, I love it. I, you know, that's why I'm passionate about the things that I think it can do better because I think it can be the best. It's already the best to me, but it could be the best to everybody if they just listen to some people. Anyway, so there is one thing that they do so well that I don't really have any complaints whatsoever at all. And that's KDE Connect. We talked about that earlier in the show and KDE Connect is so good that you have to try it because it's not about the notifications. Those notifications are really nice. Uh, but the re replying thing, that is something that people like. But my thing about KD Connect is that it's so integrated into my workflow now that I have to have KD Connect, even if I'm not using Plasma, which I'm still going to use Plasma. But even if I'm not using Plasma, I'm going to use KD Connect because it is so important. And that is, it has the functionality of integrating your clipboards. So you copy one from one device to the other, automatically copies to the other one. So you can easily paste something that you're trying to do. Like if you ha need to take an SSH key hash from one side to another, it takes literally seconds. It's awesome. And then there's also, you can transfer files really quickly just by, you know, right click in your, in Dolphin and say send to your device and you just pick which device you want to go to and it, it does it super quick. You can even automatically mount 
your phone device onto your computer as if it's a separate folder just by uh, having KDE Connect do them an amount. And it needs a certain, certain distros don't have certain packages included by default. And you do need a certain package by default. So if you use Kubuntu, it will be there. Uh, but it, I'm pretty sure it's SSHFS. But it just makes it possible for you to easily mount and just view your phone's uh, file manager system or your phone's file system with your Dolphin file manager super easily. And that kind, those kind of features are really great. If that wasn't enough, uh, there's also um, <laughs> yeah, there's also this input feature that KDE Connect has, where you can use your your touchpad, your touch screen of your phone as a touchpad for your computer. Yeah, that's, yeah, I've used that one. That's really cool. Now, here's another thing. Now, they also support not only just the touchpad part, but they also support the keyboard functionality of your phone in, as far as an input for your computer. Now, that's kind of cool. If you like swiping, that's not remotely faster than doing the actual using a keyboard, right? But there's one feature that all these fo- these app these uh, keyboards on Android or whatever have, and that is voice to text. And using that connection, you can do voice to text to your computer through the KDE Connect infrastructure, and it's super awesome. So if you have like drag and dictation on your phone, you can just use it on into your computer as if you it's built into the thing. So it's it's super smooth, and all these different features. Like there's so many things about KDE Connect that. Yes, I don't necessarily want to respond. Every time I see a response that says you reply, I'm like, no, I'll just pick up my phone. Um, like that, that, I agree with that part. And the notifications are awesome, even though they can become cumbersome. Like when you're doing a podcast, you got to do, do not disturb mode and stuff like that. Uh, but there are so many other features that makes it just a fantastic experience to use KD Connect. And that, you know, there's even stuff like random things that are not that important, like ha- being able to ping to find your phone and that kind of thing. So you can just like hit a notification on your on your desktop and say, I don't know where my phone is. I always know where my phone is. But if you don't know where your phone is, <laughs> uh, you just hit the ping and it will, you know, start ringing your phone and all sorts of stuff. Like there's, oh, there's, oh, sh- I keep going. There's music controls on your desktop through your phone, through, you can like skip, play, you can s- control like every music player you want. You can control YouTube player with the plasma integration with the browser and Firefox. So many things that KD Connect is like, you know, KD Connect is one of the reasons to use Plasma. That's how awesome it is. Okay. Uh, so immediately after this podcast, I'm going to go reinstall KDE because I've just, are you sh- like, that's quite a sales pitch. But uh, but honestly, yeah, I didn't actually know KD connected a lot of those things and I'm actually kind of like, huh, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So that Zorin Connect seems like. A, does Zorin Connect do as much? Uh, Zorin Connect is basically just re, a rebranding, reimplementation. It's not. It's not really implementation. It's a rebranding with the different pieces that make GNOME Shell work with Pl- the KD Connect. So it's. It. I haven't tested it fully to see if all the things work, but it's like pretty much everything works because they have it by default. You just got to go install the Zorin Connect app on the phone, and then it's ready to go. Because I'm pretty sure it comes by default, and it has, I'm pretty sure it has all the file system stuff built into it as well. Uh, so yeah, even if you want to use Zorin Connect, that's great too. But just know that while Zorin Connect is good, it's because KD Connect is awesome. Michael, what I'm going to do is by the next episode, which will be two weeks from now, <clears throat> I am going to go take your advice. I'm going to go try a Kubuntu in a virtual machine or something, and I'm going to try do all that stuff you said, and then then we'll see. That'll okay. be the acid test. Fantastic. So. But I would like to go ahead and just point out one more thing. If you do it in a VM, KD Connect does not work that well in a VM because you, it will do it fine. You just have to uh, tell the network to not use like a NAT network, make it uh, be on the same Wi-Fi that your actual computer is because if it's inside of a NAT network, the phone will not be on that network, so it won't detect it because it uses Wi-Fi to do it. What about a, uh, what about a live bridge. image? Or bridge connection, or, or oh, live image. Yeah, bridge connection or live image, well, perfectly fine. It just has to. They both have to be on the same Wi-Fi connection to make sure that they work. And then once you pair them, it is like it is fantastic. It'll it's it's one of those things that even if you don't want to stay with Plasma, you will want to keep KD Connect. I can almost guarantee it. So quite a discussion. Um, very insightful. Uh. I, I kind of want to just go and use KDE now. Uh, so uh, obviously big thanks to Michael for coming along and raising the tone of this podcast. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 
As uh, Michael, do you have any plugs, social plugs, anything you want to shout out before we wrap up? Oh, you're giving me a carte blanche to advertise? Okay, so... Don't talk about KDE. <laughs> okay, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll limit that one. Give... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so check out uh, Destination Linux. It's a podcast that I'm on uh, that is also a part of the Destination Linux network. So that's, uh, you know, check that out too. And uh, This Week in Linux is a news podcast that if you're, if you really can't get enough of my voice for some reason, check out both of those podcasts, uh, because I am very talkative on that and probably more so than it's this podcast and they probably wouldn't want me to continue to go. That's why we had to cut off the KDE thing, but you know, I could probably go for an extra hour because just on KDE because it's amazing or KDE Connect specifically. But, uh, you know, so, uh, but also you can check out, uh, touchdigital.com. Well, that's where I make all my content for various different things like various videos and not only just podcasts, but also different videos and just random Linux things and, you know, that kind of thing. And if you want to find, you know, get in touch with me and more, more about like casual, non-related to the Linux thing, you can check out michaeltonnell.com. And uh, I haven't updated that website, so just ignore the content, but you can find the context stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, quite a renaissance man we have here. Um, a finger in a lot of pies. Um, if you want to, if you want to catch up with us and not Michael, um, even though you should probably just catch up with him instead and forget about us, but, uh, <laughs> so you could go to. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 lost, I lost it at the fingers of the pies thing. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, this is great. This is going to be so much fun to edit, but I'm going to leave a lot of it in because this stuff is good. I don't care. Um, so as usual, you can catch up with us on Telegram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Mastodon, or just email us on show at linuxlads.com. Uh, we have short links for almost all of our socials. Mike informs me we don't have one for Mastodon. Isn't, is that still true? Uh, no, there is something on the website that goes to Mastodon. Uh, oh, okay. So it's linuxlads.com forward slash the name of the thing, and it will get you there. Um, Probably. <laughs> uh, so anyway, thank, as usual, thanks for listening. Uh, we hope to see you again when we will talk a lot less. But uh, for now, I have been Shane. I've been Connor. I've been Mike. And I've been Michael. See you guys. Michael.